Welcome to the first of a series of videos from Chapter 6, Section 1, Subsection 2. This video is going to focus on shaping the cross-section of a beam. In our last video, we talked about modes of failure for a beam. We mentioned that shear stress is one possible mode of failure. And we did this little sketch of how a wood beam would fail in shear. And it would be along uh, the center line of the beam in terms of its vertical dimension uh, near the ends. The shear force is and shear stress is largest near the end of the beam and at the neutral axis. Remembering that the neutral axis or the plane down the middle of the beam is called neutral because the moment stresses are zero there but it's definitely not neutral in terms of shear force. And we cited the example of wood because it's an anisotropic material. It tends to be very strong relative to shear failure across the grain, but very weak in terms of shear failure parallel to the grain. So this mode of failure tends to occur in wood uh, along this uh, weak plane right here. The moment stress on the other hand will fail due to a tensile failure in the bottom uh, where the moment is highest which in the case of a simple span beam is at the center of the span or it may fail by crushing of the material. In the case of wood it's usually a tearing of the fibers on the bottom. Now other materials are also weak in shear. For example, concrete has a failure here. In the case of concrete, the weakness has to do with tension and anywhere you have shear, you have some tension. Uh, in the case of the concrete beam, there will be tension along a surface like this and a surface over here. So we typically try to run some steel rebar in a manner that strengthens the material at that point in tension. Um, but Concrete has issues relative to shear failure also. In the case of wood, uh, wood fibers grew in a way that were balanced in some sense. So, uh, in fact, even though wood is relatively weak relative to shear stress, because of the shape of a tree, the shear stress tends to be relatively low. So it's less likely to see a tree failing by splitting down the middle than it is by tearing of the fibers uh, associated with some kind of moment stress. So the beam, the tree, grew the wood in a way that was relatively weak in shear, but that was because that was not such a huge issue for the tree and uh, natural selection would have prompted the tree to do a better job in that regard if in fact it was an important issue. Uh, in fact in a tree we would we would have a roundish sort of cross section on the limbs or in the trunk and the plane down the middle would be a fairly expansive plane so the shear stress um, is typically fairly low because of the large surface area involved in that plane. When we cut a rectangular beam like this, we actually are taxing the wood more than it would be taxed in nature, at least relative to the issue of shear failure, because along the neutral axis down the center of this beam, uh, we've reduced the plane. It used to be a round log with an expansive shear plane here it has a fairly modest shear plane. We would never be tempted, uh, even in cases where we want to achieve extremely high efficiency, we'd never be tempted to go in and carve material away near the neutral axis as a way of making the beam lighter because we don't want to aggravate this uh, shear issue. So in the case of wood, for solid sawn timbers, which is what we're looking at here, we would almost always keep the original rectangular cross-section that was cut. If we have materials that are somehow superior in terms of their ability to resist shear stress, then we can begin to think about reconfiguring the beam and going from a solid rectangular cross-section uh, 
which has a lot of material near the neutral axis and that material even though it's helping with shear along this plane is not helping much in terms of generating the internal resisting moment because this material near that neutral axis has a very small lever arm and it has a very low stress in it. So we would rather configure our beams in the shape of this I section where we have more material further from the neutral axis and that material has a better lever arm and also has more stress in it so it's able to generate more internal resisting moment. We can do this in the case of steel because steel is really excellent in shear and it's rare that a, a I section of this sort in steel would fail by shear. A steel beam almost always fails by uh, moment stress failure or some kind of local buckling or exhibiting too much deflection. In the case of uh, wood, uh, we, can, we can also do well if we use a material for the web which is highly resistive to shear. In this case you see some eye joist that have um, either in this case uh, micro lamb um, flanges top and bottom and oriented strand board for the webs and this oriented strand board is pretty resistive to shear you also see um, eye joists of this sort made with plywood webs which are even better in shear so as I mentioned in the case of steel uh, steel is so strong in shear that we often make beams with very uh, thin webs, in fact thin enough that buckling becomes the issue and we often have to weld stiffeners to them to keep them from buckling. But this will be a kind of a typical shape for a wide flange beam and the, all of the things that you see in this image are wide flanges except for this gusset plate which is a plate and this bracing member which is a square tube. We can even make eye sections in concrete but as I mentioned concrete tends to be not terribly good in shear so you'll notice we're not making the web really thin here uh, and furthermore we're going to add a fair amount of steel reinforcing in order to make sure that this beam works well. Also we probably will use a fairly high grade of steel of concrete which will have an inherently better uh, shear capacity. Okay, so let's talk about what we can do with beams after we've turned them into I sections, or in the case of steel, we now refer to them as wide flanges. So in this case, we've got um, an I section beam that's been made out of sheets of styrene that are a sixteenth of an inch thick. This is an inch and a half that's an inch and a half and the top flange is an inch and a half and we've shown the end of one of these beams where we've cut back the flanges but let the web go through and if we take that web and we insert it into the slot and it becomes the support for the beam we discover that that web works pretty well in shear so even though this is pretty lightweight uh, styrene um, and is pretty rubbery and thin and vulnerable to buckling. Uh, we're able to support a couple of kilograms here easily and we could have actually gone much higher but this illustrates the point that that little shear tab sticking out which is just the extension of the web is working quite well and we're not bothered by the removal of the flanges here. So uh, one of the things that this leads us to is a kind of generalization that shear is handled predominantly by the web in an eye section beam and the flanges are relatively unimportant in terms of resisting shear. So you will often see the flanges mutilated or cut back in some way uh, to accommodate whatever kind of connection system. Now normally we wouldn't cradle the end of this beam uh, in the way we're showing here it would be clip angled and bolted or welded to some structure but in this case it was easier to just insert it into this wooden slot to illustrate this point.
Now, if we go to the center of the beam and we remove some of that flange, we discover a radically different situation. The beam uh, is tending to be laterally unstable, but it also has this huge problem that the flanges are primarily there to resist moment, and the web is not very good at resisting moment. The moment tends to be high at the center of the span, and as a consequence, we're seeing all manner of failure here. In this case, the beam is tending to buckle laterally, but we're also creating stress concentration in the thin web at the top because all the force that would normally be carried in these flanges, all the force is arriving from each side and there's a gap in the flanges. So the flanges are transferring all that force to the top of the web member which is either going to crush or buckle itself. So, as a general rule, we can cut away the flange where we're, we have no moment, but we're primarily dealing with shear force, but we do not want to cut away the flanges anywhere that we need to generate a significant moment. On the other side of the coin, um, anywhere we have a high shear force, we cannot cut away uh, the web without doing severe damage. The web is primarily responsible for shear, and in this case you're, you're being uh, given an illustration of the fact that flanges don't work very well in terms of resisting shear. It's really crucial that the, this web be continuous uh, particularly in this zone where the shear force is quite high. On the other hand, interestingly enough, at the center of the beam where we have zero shear and only moment, we can cut away the web without such deleterious effects. Uh, we do want to worry about this local part of the flanges uh, buckling, particularly on the top, but in this case you'll notice our two kilograms of force is being handled quite well in spite of the discontinuity of the web. The, f the uh, flanges are still there. The flanges are primarily responsible for moment, which is the primary problem at the center span of this beam. Okay, so <clears throat> we've got these diagrams that we have talked about. Um, high shear at the ends high moment at the center. Uh, if we wanted to design a beam and shape it appropriately to deal with moment, it would look something like this. And in fact, you can kind of think of this as a beam, although we normally call it an arch with a tie member. But the overall shape of this is parabolic, which is the perfect shape for addressing the internal moment. So we're not really showing a beam exactly, but we are showing what the general shape is and how you go about achieving that. This is the connection at the end with the arch coming down and the time member going across. So we would like a beam that is generally deeper in the middle. Uh, in, in most cases, beams tend to be what, we, what I would call the quick and dirty solution, which is we don't have a huge span, we don't have a huge load, we're looking for something that will get the job done fairly quickly. So we don't tend to make beams that are as elaborately sculpted as this. We tend to look at situations and ask ourselves, how can we make it deeper in the middle and what benefits can we derive from that? So in this case, we're looking at a glue lamb beam that has this nice curve on the bottom, which people always love. But to handle shingles, we need uh, a certain minimum slope, so we can't have this flat on the top. So the sloped roof has been set at an appropriate angle to allow the shingles to function effectively. And in that manner, we have an outer bound of the beam that's set by the slope of the roof, an inner bound that's set by this desirable curvature, and that yields a beam which is somewhat deeper at the center. Now, the variation in depth along this beam is clearly not parabolic, but it's, it's, a, it's pointing in the right direction in that it's giving us greater depth at the middle than we have at the ends.
Here's another example of a beam that is uh, tending to take on that shape where there's greater depth at the center than at the ends. This is a glass mullion which is serving as a beam under wind load against this glass and they've tapered it so that it's thinner at the ends or not so deep at the ends as it is in the middle. Again, this is not parabolic. We could have made it parabolic but it would have cost more money to do that. We could have trimmed it all along here on the perfect curve, but it was easier to just cut the glass at this angle and approximate a parabola. All right, so here we have another structure that's doing a similar thing. We have glass that's thinner at the top and bottom under wind load uh, against this wall, and it's thicker at the middle uh, in order to get greater bending strength. Now these elements here, these are thick steel plates. They are glued and then uh, siliconed to this glass. And it turns out that this joint develops the full strength of the glass. So you shouldn't be too concerned that there's a joint in the middle. Effectively this glass is this depth as a bending member. Here's another example. This is the airport in Phoenix, Arizona. It's a steel plate, a series of steel plate beams. Uh, the webs are cut on a giant shear into this triangular shape and then the flanges are welded on. So this is classic plate girder technology except this is occurring at a, at a much lighter scale than we typically see for plate girders and their primary reason for doing this was to a large degree aesthetic but it also yields a very efficient beam which is deeper where it needs to be deeper. These beams are also mutually bracing because they run diagonally across the space and in the welding process you know that, notice that they've done a very elegant job. These have to be full penetration welds and then they are subsequently ground down to produce this nice smooth finish. Um, <clears throat> this is a bracing element which is running to the outer walls. This is another view of that space. This is a somewhat less dramatic example. Um, again the beam gets shallower near the ends, deeper near the middle, in the previous case everything was sloping down in order to get water off this roof this top flange is actually sloping slightly to both sides um, and so in the case of this beam they decided to um, make the slope of the bottom flange and the slope of the top flange the same which allows you to sort of read this shape on the bottom and at the same time uh, have the shape on the top to allow water runoff. Now in the case of certain materials we may want to do more uh, elegant and fancy shaping of the section. For example this is a concrete uh, prefabricated precast concrete beam. You'll notice it's a very pronounced eye shape near the middle where the shear forces are small and then where the shear forces are larger uh, it's the thick rectangular cross section. So all the material is working in shear here. Almost all the material is working in moment at the center. Uh, we can take that a step further and we can mimic the parabolic uh, force variation in the top flange by making it wider at the center in this case you'll notice the widening is parabolic in shape so the top flange has been made really wide in order to provide more compression concrete in this case they didn't do that on the bottom because they know that the the tensile capability of this beam is being provided by the tensile steel at the bottom so this is kind of the ultimate expression and You'll notice here they've even widened off the bottom which has potential as a sort of bearing uh, surface enhancement. But you see the thick end where the shear, uh, all the material is basically working in shear.
and then in the center where essentially all the material is working and generating the moment. Now we have less elegant but more common examples. This would be a double T. There's steel at the bottom of uh, these ribs and all of this is cast as an integrated unit and we have um, a concrete flange at the top which forms the decking for the floor or the roof. So again it's thin down at the bottom because it's dense with steel at that point and the steel does not need to be that large in dimension. But it's got a lot of concrete at the top which is appropriate because concrete does not have as high a stress capacity but it's also a very nice fit with other issues because making this flange at the top wide uh, makes it inherently suitable as a floor. Here's another example where we have more material in the top than near the bottom. In this case it's been sculpted in a rather complex way. Uh, it's a tubular cross-section because this curvilinear bridge uh, is tending to keel over to the side because it has torsion in it. So the classic shape that we use for torsion is this uh, closed tube. You'll also notice another very elegant feature which is this top piece is thickened over this support because that's where we have a very strong negative moment. So the decking has actually been sculpted in a way that represents the stress patterns and we'll come back to that later on in fact uh, in video three where we talk about uh, beams other than simple span beams such as beams with double cantilevers. In this case this decking is actually a beam that spans all the way from there to there with two cantilevers and then some material between the supports. Okay, so another way that we can make the beam shape responsive to the variable moment is to say, well, we know the moment is largest at the middle, and if we're welding up plate girders anyway, and we don't need to, or we can't run the material the full length of the beam, we may choose to use a certain width of flange near the ends and then a wider flange in between. Now in order to make this work this has to be a very high quality full penetration joint. Uh, with modern welding techniques we're easily able to master that so a beam like this becomes very reliable and the failure is no more likely to occur there than somewhere else in this beam. You'll notice that this flange has been tapered slightly to reduce somewhat the stress concentration at that corner. So I mentioned earlier that um, we can use eye sections um, even in wood. So here you see a beam with some eye joist where the loads get heavier around these dormers for example instead of eye joist we're using uh, laminated veneer lumber. Um, all the really short stuff in this building like these collar beams and those collar beams there um, are solid sawn lumber, the studs are solid sawn lumber. The really high stress cases though are laminated veneer lumber and here's an example. This um, piece that's spanning the fireplace, the fireplace had to be central in the case of this building there is a large steel uh, roof beam uh, that arrives at this point. It's being brought down in this tubular column and that load is getting transferred to a whole bunch of 2x4s. All of that load is getting centered over, this, over the fireplace and this beam as a consequence is a very heavily loaded deep beam its failure mode will tend to occur in shear and because of that uh, laminated veneer lumber has been chosen because it works really well in shear. That ends our video on the topic of shaping 
the cross-section of a beam.